Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. A reading from the book of Exodus. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you, will, you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance as fine as the frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your, your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and the Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, <clears throat> when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity to the measure of the full statutes of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by peace people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming, But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body, body's growth in building itself up in love. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to John. On the next day, when the people who remained after the feeding of the 5,000 saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Gospel of our Savior. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for having me again. It's always a pleasure to be with you anytime I can. Sometimes the lectionary is constructed perfectly. At its best, it shows the interweaving of narratives throughout Scripture. From beginning to end, Scripture is filled with threads that contrast and support each other, and placing them directly next to each other brings out their ongoing internal dialogue. How many of you all have seen the backside of a piece of embroidery or textile art? Raise your hands. Seeing some nods? Okay, for any of you who haven't, there are tapestries in the corridors. Feel free to just look behind. (laughs) On the front, you'll notice that it's a very clear picture. And on the back, you see everything that went into it, a very tangled knot of different colored threads. Here, too, there are a tangle of references to the Old Testament We're going to begin by looking at that to better understand the depth of the picture before us in John. So the clear picture is that we begin today with God feeding the children of Israel as they wander in the wilderness. We're told that for 40 years they're sustained every day by the heavenly bread. Day by day God trains them to put their faith in God's power and providence rather than the might of Pharaoh or their ability to care for themselves. We move from the event itself to Israel's reflection on that event in the Psalms. And then we end with Jesus reenacting and building upon this wilderness story in our gospel. Here's the tangle, right? Starting last week in the story's introduction, we hear that Jesus is teaching on a mountain which is a strong reference to Moses teaching on Mount Sinai, especially because we also hear it's during Passover, which is a time that celebrates God's liberation of the Hebrew people from Egypt. The people's reaction to this event is to cry, finally, the prophet we've been waiting for. And as Reverend Roseanne pointed out last week, this exclamation of prophet refers not only to Moses, but also to Elisha. Remember, Moses was the prophet who, by God's grace, freed the people from slavery in Egypt and led them to Israel. Elisha, meanwhile, 
organized a national spiritual and political revitalization movement under a corrupt Israeli king, as well as multiplied food for a large crowd. This combination is especially appropriate because the people in Jesus' day are facing opposition, both foreign and domestic. They were conquered by Rome and were heavily taxed through their leaders in Jerusalem. As a side note, when John refers to the Jews, which happens over and over and over again, it's easy to think the people in Fairmount Temple But what he's actually meaning are the leaders in Jerusalem, right? So the Jews, like we would say the Russians, we mean Vladimir Putin. He means the people in Jerusalem, not the Jewish people. Okay. So Jesus combines this tradition of resistance to foreign and domestic powers and calls people to give their loyalty to God. The author weaves all of these connections and more, we don't even have time today, to the exodus, to Passover, to revival movements, to help us understand who Jesus is. He is the Son of God, another prophet appointed by God to save their people from their enemies and reorient them to God's way of living. As we've said today, our gospel begins with the story of manna and ends with the people asking Jesus to feed them again as God did with bread from heaven. How does he respond? I am the bread from heaven sent to give life to the world. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now let's just pause here. This story probably sounds very familiar to many of you but let's try to tune in to the strangeness of this response. Poor people, hungry people, for whom bread means survival, ask Jesus for food, and he says, I am the bread sent to give life to the world. What could Jesus possibly mean here? I went about investigating this in two different ways. I think today we're going to to look into what does he mean by believing in him at all, and why is he calling himself bread? So beginning with belief, this one seems easier to understand. We hear people talking about believing in Jesus all the time. It's on billboards, it's on radio programs, people are talking about it all the time. I don't think we're set up well to understand what Jesus meant by this, though. Because when I hear Jesus say, the work of God is to believe in him who sends me, I immediately have the ghost of Billy Graham calling me to get down on my knees, pray a prayer, and believe in Jesus. This evangelical notion of belief is conceptual and intellectual. It asks, do you believe Jesus existed and died and rose again for you? However, modern writers define the first century notion of belief, what Jesus probably would have been thinking, more existentially. It's about loyalty and commitment. We still use it like this, just not when we're talking about Jesus. So a contemporary example of this meaning might be, the Democratic Party stopped believing in Joe Biden. He dropped out of the race because the party no longer had faith he could fulfill his campaign promises. That's not a condemnation or endorsement. It's an example of how we can talk about belief and faith and not talk about, do we believe there is a man named Joe, right? We're talking about trust, loyalty, commitment to a vision of the world. Jesus's vision of the world is one of supreme trust and loyalty in the triune God. For his audience, this meant ceding their loyalty from Rome and the Jerusalem leaders and giving it to their creator. We have a different context, but we still have powers that ask for our allegiance and claim that they will ultimately satisfy us. The state asks us to give them allegiance above all other commitments and says Americans are worth more than any other human life on the planet. Capitalism asks us to find our meaning in work and that making a profit 
and claims people are only as useful as they're able to work and they're as valuable as they are the paycheck they make. Our cultural narrative of the family says we'll find our true and ultimate satisfaction in our romantic partner and asks us to sacrifice all other relationships for the health of our nuclear family. We could go on. There are lots of things that claim they'll satisfy us and ask us for their faith. Jesus calls us to, put our, to make our true family the church, not meaning St. Paul's, which is a lovely place, but the universal church. This church continues Christ's incarnation as his body in the world. This body breaks the bonds of family and nation. Scripture calls the church strangers and aliens wherever they go because their primary citizenship is in God's coming kingdom, not where they happen to live. This body like Christ is oriented to helping and organizing for the least, the last, and the lost and views all people as inherently valuable because God created them. You can see what he means when he says that believing in God putting your trust in this vision of society is truly the work of God. It's a high calling. It's a high ask. So when Christ says belief and faith, he means loyalty and commitment. What does he mean when he says bread? Personally, I find it helpful here to remember this text today was written to churches to help them understand their own story. This passage doesn't make sense to me at least, if we imagine Jesus, the historical person, standing in front of hungry people and saying, I am bread. It's a little more clear if we remember this is aimed at a community that was centered around care for the poor and celebration of the Eucharist. So I have with me an unconsecrated priest's host. I think today this is what Jesus means when he says, I am the bread of life. Like the reference to manna from heaven, this chief symbol of the church represents all of the ways we connect with God and are fed and transformed into their image. The whole arc of scripture is God seeking deeper relationship to humanity until they offer their very body to bring us into their divine life. We as the Episcopal Church believe that this is more than an intellectual sign, that it's effectual. God does something when we take the Eucharist. It gives life to the world because it connects us to the source of all life, the Creator, and forms us, knits us together, as Ephesians says, into the body of Christ. Paul weaves all of these threads and references more than we have time to mention to show how God's work culminates in the life of ministry and continues in our very midst today. We're asked to give our loyalty to God above all else, and we're sustained in that commitment by the bread of life through the Eucharist. This passage calls us to a life of commitment to God first and foremost, which is going to look different for each and every one of us. For me, over the years, it has meant starting a union. It meant moving to rural Tennessee to go to seminary and then coming to Cleveland to work for Greater Cleveland Congregations and to be with you today. These moves threw my life into chaos and were difficult on every level, but I've been sustained through it all by God, through the sacraments and a great community around you like the one you have with here. God's call always upends something and asks us to make difficult choices, reassess our priorities, and to step out in faith. But it's always worth it in the end. It's always, always worth it. Last I was able to preach here, we talked about what God might be calling y'all to do as a church. I understand I've heard since then. You're starting a long-term discernment project, uh, which I'm very excited about, and I can't wait to hear how it develops. Now, the beauty of this is you get to do whatever you want, and there are so many things to invest your time and power in. Here's something along the lines of what that could look like. Many of you probably know 
but the Cleveland area is one of the most food insecure places in the nation. By some estimates, we're the third most food insecure city in all 50 states. A church of your size, with your connections, could say, we have a tradition of God feeding us and caring for our immediate needs. Our church is organized around a ritual meal that turns us into the bread of life for the world. We're going to build on that and continue that tradition by making sure no one in our area goes hungry. Define area however you want. We're going to find out what populations aren't already served by the many good people doing good work and make sure that no child, no elder, no one that God has created and called good has to go to sleep hungry. That would be a wild commitment that would call on you to depend on God every day. Luckily, you have church neighbors like Fairmount Presbyterian, Church of the Savior down the street, First Baptist, and many, many others that are well-resourced and share your commitment to Christ and the world and can be partners in whatever you decide to do. Perhaps some of you are thinking, Nathan, it's all well and good for God to feed people and get them to rely on them for their daily needs. We're supposed to do that. But we don't want to disempower people and get them to depend on us to meet their daily needs. I agree, it's a tricky situation. Which is why it's so great that whatever you decide to do, how whatever immediate need you decide to work, you are members of greater Cleveland congregations and you can investigate long-term social issues, asking the question, why is anyone hungry? Why are people poor? Why are they homeless in the wealthiest nation on the planet? People have created systems that cause these outcomes, and people like you can fix those systems. The story of the universe is holy mystery drawing humanity into relationship. They are calling everyone who will listen to join them, commit to their vision of a healed world where all are equal, where violence has ceased, and where every need is satisfied. You individually and collectively have a part to play in that. And I can't wait to see what you all do. And now, standing as you are able, let us confess our faith as found in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. 
We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Sean, our presiding bishop-elect, and Anne, our bishop and for all the clergy and people. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Joe, our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this city of Cleveland, and for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those on our prayer list, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and, op and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, Remembering especially David Harris, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of Mary the God-bearer, St. Paul the Apostle, and all the saints who have borne witness to Christ, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To thee, O Lord, our God. O oh Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. 
And the peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, good morning and welcome. We're so glad you're with us to worship our Lord in this sacred space. If you're new and visiting to St. Paul's, we hope you'll fill out one of the welcome cards which can be found in the pew in front of you. And once you do that, a clergy member will reach out to welcome you to the community and to answer any questions that you might have about the parish. And if you're watching online, I hope you will fill out the welcome card in the link that's found below the video. We'd also encourage you to take a look at all the programs and services going on here at St. Paul's. You have, of course, your Sunday notes, the weekly e-news that comes out on Thursdays, our monthly newsletter, Parish Notes. And there is a brand new one for August, and it's available to pick up around the church. And, of course, there's always our website that's just packed with all of the things that go on in this very busy place. And right now, I would invite Reverend Patricia to come forward. Come on over, Daniel. Go, go. go. <laughs> yeah. So I think most of you know that Daniel Colliner has been our organ scholar for the past year, and uh, your musical gifts have lifted our hearts and strengthened our worship, and we are so appreciative. This is um, a bittersweet day because it's Daniel's last day. With all the talent that he has, he is just a high school senior and has just graduated, and he's going to be moving on to the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia. So we hope he'll come back and visit us, but we didn't want to let him leave without thanking you so much for all that you've given us and leaving him with a blessing. So if you look in your bulletin, let us say a blessing together for you to receive in your heart, Daniel. Let us pray together. O oh God, whom saints and angels delight to worship, be ever present with all your servants who seek through music to perfect the praises offered by your people on earth. We humbly place in your hands Daniel Colliner as he embarks on the next chapter of his education. We thank you for his witness to your love through the gifts of his beautiful music that has strengthened us and lifted our hearts and spirits. We pray he may feel held in your love always, O Lord. Keep him in health, safety, and the truth of your joy. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you so much. <laughs> you really Continuing with some announcements, um, you'll notice that Reverend Gabriel's kind of missing in action today. He's just taking a little rest and we'll be back next week. Um, Habitat for Humanity is sponsoring a neighborhood cleanup day on August 24th, and they're looking for many hands to make that work light. So if you'd see the information in the Sunday notes, it will tell you how you can join in that effort. And we'd like to thank Marie Colliner for sponsoring the Coffee Hour Donuts today. Since it is the first Sunday of the month, we would at this time like to pray for those who will have birthdays or anniversaries during the month of August. If that is you, we'd ask you to please stand for a blessing. And let us pray together as found in your bulletin. 
O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious God, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and maker of all. Jesus stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, Almighty God, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Christ. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Savior, by Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. worshiping online to receive the grace of the sacrament by praying the prayer of spiritual communion found in your online bulletin. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of Christ and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Savior, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. The blessing of God who delivers us, the grace of Christ who sustains us, and the communion of the Spirit who empowers us be with you always with the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Let us go forth in the world rejoicing in the spirit.